Now to a singer-songwriter whose decades-long career continues to flourish. At 83, Judy Collins is up for another Grammy Award for her latest album, Spellbound. It's her first record that's made up entirely of all her own material, from working with Leonard Cohen to singing for President Kennedy. She tells Walter Isaacson about the personal and musical journey that's got her to this moment. Thank you, Chris John and Judy Collins. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I'm so glad to be here with you. Man, it's been 60 years of a storied career. You've had, uh, I think, 29 albums this earlier this year. Spellbound came out, your uh, new album. And yet at age 83, you're forever young. Tell me how it feels to have such success after all six decades. It's, it's a, an amazing thing. I'm sure that you'll identify with this. Today is as good as it gets. <laughs> And I woke up today and I was actually alive and, and ready to roll. And so that's really the prize, I guess you would say, because there were many times during my career when that wasn't true. And I'm so lucky today because I've got my health, my, my home, my husband, my career, my adventures, the things that I want to do next. And so it feels like the, the, the road is clear and I'm on it. You talk about the times when that wasn't the case and that's reflected in this new album. Tell me about some of those times. Well, I've written about, oh, for instance, Arizona, one of the songs on the album is really a kind of a meditation on being in lockdown in, in uh, Tucson, Arizona, when I was diagnosed with tuberculosis. I was 60, it was 1960. Two, and I was in big trouble. I was having um, terribly gurgle in my lungs, and I didn't know what was wrong. And I wouldn't go to a doctor because I didn't want to slow down the train, you know. And I had just come back from doing Carnegie Hall opening for Theodore Bikel, my friend Theodore. So it's up and down. Then you get on a plane after New York at Carnegie Hall and go to Tucson to the Ash Alley. And there was two kids that ran that Ash Alley. And when I sang that night, they said to me, I think we're going to take you over to the doctor. So from my wild ride across the country and into what I was looking at was 50 more shows. I was in a long wing at the end of this hospital looking out at the hills and the beautiful colors of Arizona. And that's where I wrote this song. Arizona Star. Let me quote a lyric from that song you just talked about, Arizona, when you talk about you healed all the wounds that were hidden and left them for all to be seen. I think you were fighting not only tuberculosis, you'd had alcoholism, you had some family issues. Tell me how that song now, this song now, helps you process all that. And how did you process it back then? I had a, you know, I wasn't. I was literally in uh, in lockdown, but my marriage was in trouble and I was on the way to a divorce anyway. But I had my my journal, which I've kept pretty, pretty regularly for all these decades. And so I was able to write and sink and be by myself and be focused on this glorious outdoors, the gold and the and the red and the blue and the birds. It was spectacular so it was very healing to me and every time I sing it I think <laughs> you know uh, that was a lucky break that I got I got it exactly at the time that I needed it and that's always true when I sing it as well it gives me the break I need to reflect well as you say you didn't write songs at first and you're well known of course for covering songs by everybody from Bob Dylan to Leonard Cohen to you know Joan Baez tell this album is the first one, right? That is all original songs you wrote. Why did you make that pivot? I started recording in 61, and then in 1966, and I had made five albums by then of other people's songs and of a lot of traditional things. 
And then I met up with Leonard Cohen and um, he uh, he said, I don't understand why you're not writing your own songs. Everybody else is. Why aren't you? And I raced home and wrote a song called Since You've Asked. What I give you since you've asked is all my time together. And that was my first song. And I've written in these past 60 years, I've written about 60 songs. I've recorded them on albums with songs from other other artists, of course. Um, everything from both sides now to the Northwest Passage. When 2016, I started writing a lot of poetry and to be sort of the feeder for the songs. And I said to my husband, I'm going to do 90 poems in 90 days. And he said, well, why don't you do 365 days? And then by the end of the year, you'll have a year's worth of poetry and probably some songs. So I did that. And I harvested out of that 365 days, a lot of songs. And when I came to the end of the year, I thought, you know, you were right. And I've got, I've got a ton of songs and I went on writing. And by the time the COVID locked us down, I said, oh, this is life changing. You know, after the, after the plague came the res renaissance. <laughs> when you jumped on that folk music train and it comes out of Pete Seeger and Woody Guthrie, they tend to be protest songs. They tend to be political songs. And that was true throughout the 1960s. Why did folk sort of become the soundtrack of the 60s politics? Well, it's a good question, but it was a natural fit because previous to that, in the 50s, you needed a big band, you needed a big dress, you needed a big name, you needed a lot of noise, you needed to be very expensive and hot and get it done, but it was it was hard. And so there was a kind of a growing underground of the folk singer with the one with the one instrument, with the one song, and with a message which was quite often beautiful. I am a maid of constant sorrow. That was my first album, my first song on my first album. Or perhaps so, the Irish songs about, uh, ah, then tell me, Sean O'Farrell, tell me why you hurry so. The, there was a mixture of political music, traditional music, old, old, old songs, brand new songs. Dylan was starting to write and writing things like, Tambourine Man, but he also wrote uh, Masters of War. So it was a combination of exotic, esoteric beauty and, you know, get down, get to it, protest music. But you and Pete Seeger in the 1960s could turn things that you wouldn't normally think of as a protest song. And just by the way you did it, it would feel that way. And in particular, I remember Turn, Turn, Turn to Everything There's a oh, Season. Tell yes. me about that one. You did it with yes. him, right? So true. It had comes from the Bible. He wrote it, uh, wrote it out of one of the verses in, in one of the Bible chapters. And it has... Wait, give me, give me a few lines of it. So to everything, turn, turn, turn. There is a season, turn, turn, turn. So I guess it gives you a feeling of surrender and acceptance, but also you know that you have to go on and you can't just accept the fact that you may have done something right today, but tomorrow will come and you'll have to do it again. Aren't we seeing that of late? <laughs> the soundtrack, I think, of my early years was your cover of Both Sides Now. And there's a wistfulness to that song. And yet when I heard Spellbound, this new album, it was almost captured the same way in that song, So Alive. We were young together oh. once upon a <laughs> long lost time. Tell me about those two songs and wistfulness and seeing life from Both Sides Now. My sister called me after she heard So Alive and she said, who is that about? Because there's a line in there about um, you always left by dawn. We slept in a single bed and you always left by dawn. And I said, I think it's about a young singer who's unfortunately gone at an early age. Um, his name was David Blue and he had a single bed and he always left by dawn. 
you know, that was, those were the days. <laughs> when I moved to New York in 1963, my, I was divorced. I had come straight from the hospital in Denver. I first, I was in Tucson for a, a couple of months and then they moved me to the National Jewish Hospital in Denver, which is my, my hometown, so to speak. The first thing that I did out of a hospital bed from Denver was to go to Washington and to sing for President Kennedy at the dinner for the president, which was a B'nai B'ris event, which they have. I think they have it on a regular basis. And I was lucky enough to be invited to the 1963 event. wrote and recorded most of these songs uh, during the pandemic. I think you did it in person, right? Tell me about that experience. Well, we had the first, the first recording session we had was in 2019, before this all broke out. And I did, I recorded a couple of songs. I recorded the Arizona song, which of course is on the album. And I recorded Grand Canyon, I believe, and uh, perhaps... Uh, one other song, Girl from Colorado, probably. Then we moved into the pandemic, but we found a studio in Brook, I think it was in Astoria, which was open during the pandemic. So sometime in March or April, we went off and did a recording session there. And uh, we got, you know, we all wore masks, except when we were singing, so to speak. So it worked out fine. There was a lot of help during the pandemic, enough for me to get my, my work done. Thank goodness. Tell me about your writing process and how you decide on themes. My first way of learning songs is to make a tape. For instance, uh, Leonard used to send me songs. every About every 18 months, he would send Leonard me. Leonard Cohen, yeah. Leonard Cohen. He would send me another little, little tape with a bunch of songs, and he'd say, figure out what you want to sing. So I would play them. I would play a bunch of songs, and then... When one stuck in my mind and I heard it sort of in real time, then I'd know it was for me. Now, the, the, the finding of songs is that when I hear it, I know it. I've had a lot of magical situations come into my life. For instance, one night I was uh, sound asleep. I was actually probably passed out. It was 1967. So that would have been, <laughs> that was the life then. And um, I was still drinking. By the way, I'm now 45 years sober, which is a miracle. And I thank you and everybody in the world who helps me to stay sober. And uh, I woke up at three in the morning. It was Al Cooper on the phone. He was a friend of mine. And he said, I have a surprise for you. He had been to a party at one of the clubs and where the Blood, Sweat and Tears was playing. And he ran into this girl she was a girl then. She was young. And she said, I write songs. And he said, oh, and are they any good? And she said, yes. And he said, can I hear them? And she said, why don't you come home with me? And I said, well, she was good looking. So I went home with her and it was Joni Mitchell. And he put her on the phone with me at three in the morning. And she sang me Both Sides Now. And then you did that great cover of Both Sides Now. Sing a little of that for us, if you would. Oh, well, it's very easy because everybody knows it because it was such a big hit. Rose and flows of angel hair. And ice cream castles in the air. You'll hear it and you'll know it, you know, because you've heard it for century now. Tell me about the auto accident you had when you were 17 and how that affected you. Oh, God. I finally wrote about it in this album. I wrote about it for years. I wrote about it. It's called Hell on Wheels. I was working at one of the one of the mountain resorts in Grand Lake. It was wonderful. It was called Jenny Lemon's Lodge. And I was there the summers of, of when I was 16 and when I was 17. When I was 17, I had a driver's license, a learner's license, but I didn't have a car. But I decided that I would try to borrow a car and go over to the Stanley to visit a friend of mine who was who was working and living in Estes Park. 
And so I got in that car, drove over, had lunch with her, and we had, you know, a couple of drinks. I don't know, I, enough for me to be not behind a wheel. But I was, I was young. I was um, crazy. And so I got in the car and took off, and I hit a dirt road in on my way back to Long's to uh, to Grand Lake. And suddenly I found myself stuck between a fence and a road, and down on the road to my left, sitting by the road, were two little babies sitting on this little blanket. They were fine, but I had missed them by a near a mere few feet. And their their dad came running out of the house and screaming at me and saying, you know, I'm going to call the cops on you and I'm going to get you out of here. I'm going to get a rope and pull you out. Well, he went to do that and I rocked my car back and forth and got out of the mess and sped away. But I, it has haunted me ever since. And so one of the songs on the album is called Hell on Wheels, which Ari has helped me to finish. I finally pulled it out after years of mulling over the lyric and trying to figure out how I could make it work. You never see it coming, hell on wheels. You always think you're in control. Someday you realize you're hell on wheels. You know you have to go slow. The folk music of the 60s and 70s was driven by protests, politics, other things. I get the feeling now, and correct me if I'm wrong, that folk music has lost some of that energy or drive or urgency. Is that right? Not in me. Not in my life. Not in my writing. Not in what I want to hear. And how I can see through the mist of the dust of what's coming up around us, how I can see how the the clarity of what we saw and did is appropriate today and still must be uh, paid attention to. Judy Collins, thank you so much for being with us. God bless you. Thank you so much.